Hi everyone, as Devin said, I'm Nancy Levis and my co-presenter is Morgan Ritchie Baum and we're very excited to talk with y'all today about um, what is data literacy and why is it important? If my slides will advance, there we go. Uh, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. Before we dive into the nitty gritty of what we're talking about today, I um, just wanted to introduce myself a little more informally. I really enjoy dinner parties and picnics, which has been really fun when the weather's nice um, during these COVID months. Um, I have somehow turned into a pie crust baking uh, as a as a side hobby. Um, I've taught a couple of pie crust baking classes um, that one got featured by the New York Times um, earlier this this fall. So that's my recent claim to fame. And I'm Morgan coming to you live from the Greensboro Public Library in my fabulous uh, cubicle space. So I'm wearing my mask today as a as a good coworker does. So uh, hopefully you can hear me all okay. Um, but yes, uh, also informally here, really enjoy gardening. I've uh, I'm on, on a vegan journey right now. So I've had a lot of fun uh, playing around with that. And I, uh, I joined the hordes of people who got pandemic kittens and uh, have been enjoying myself um, and kittenness. So um, yes, yeah, so that's a lot of fun. All right, Nancy, you can go into the next slide. All right, so today uh, we hope to provide you all with uh, a lot of information and inspiration around the topic of data literacy. Um, one thing Nancy and I discovered is there's a lot of definitions for data literacy. There's a lot of unsatisfactory definitions for data literacy. So we hope to give you a working definition that we find to be very actionable and very useful. Um, we recognize that data literacy is a pretty complex topic and can be pretty scary and intimidating. So we hope um, to make that a little bit more approachable. Uh, we also hope to emphasize, you know, why talking about data literacy is important and from both a public library and an academic library perspective. Um, and although I don't think Nancy and I would say we are data experts, we are definitely data enthusiasts. So we hope to share some of that enthusiasm with you today and get you enthusiastic as well. Um, and hope to show you as well how you're already engaging with data literacy um, and you just might not realize it. So hopefully we'll have some fun today. And before we dive into our, before we dive into the provided definition of data literacy, we wanted to ask you what um, data literacy means to you. So if you would follow the instructions, and I've put them in the chat as well, um, to go to menti.com and use the the provided code to answer answer these questions. How do you feel about data? When I first started in library school, I was kind of on the meh uh, kind of portion of that scale. And but then in the last few years, working with business and economics students, I have slowly drifted towards the uh, let's figure it out portion, which I didn't put that in. Um, so I guess I would I would love it now. I love that we have so many data lovers. Yeah, it's really great. All right. So there's another question I have for you. Um, what does data literacy mean to you? Kind of an open-ended, feel free to write as much or as little as you please. Oops, 
So our first couple of responses, numbers and interpreting statistics. What is it? How can I use it? Um, spreadsheets. Um, being able to interpret it and do something new with it. Um, ambiguous term that is thrown around a lot. Yes, yes. Um, understanding the uses and misuses of numbers. Um, how statistics can be used to mislead people. Um, ethical use of data. Yeah, there's a lot of numbers in here. Um, one question that my coworkers and I in my institution have been thinking about is like, what does data mean to um, the humanities? Like our paintings and images data. Um, so that has been, it's a really neat question to think about and important. Interpreting data in news stories. I like this response, the ability to understand and utilize data with a critical gaze. Yeah. Thank you for sharing um, what data literacy means to you. The response, this, this, these poll responses, um, I can include that. I can share that with Devin to include in the um, materials that she sends out after the session. Thanks all for your really insightful responses. So here is our definition of data taken from an article written by Wendy Pothier and Patricia Condon in 2019. Data literacy is the ability to ask and answer real world questions from large and small data sets through an inquiry process with consider consideration of ethical use of data. So as we continue to move through this presentation, this is the understanding and definition of data literacy that we are working with. And now Morgan will talk about data literacy in a public library context. Okay, thank you, Nancy. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. All right, so I thought I'd get started today by just talking about a little bit of my personal journey um, coming to data literacy, uh, the evolving journey of me coming to data literacy, because I think it might be one that is uh, familiar uh, to a lot of you. And uh, yes, Allison, we can definitely share that definition in the chat. Um, so I think for a lot of us, if we went to library school, we encountered a lot about information literacy and we felt pretty cool about that, felt pretty good about that, felt like we could start applying that in our everyday work. But as a business and nonprofit librarian, when I started um, working with entrepreneurs and small business owners and nonprofits, uh, I realized data literacy, which I'd heard a little bit about in library school, I realized that it was a really big thing and it was a really big scary thing. Um, and I started to put up mental blocks in my own mind about data literacy. Numbers and I, we don't get along so much. So I thought that's it. I'm never going to be able to, to understand data literacy, statistical literacy. There's technical skills that go into it. Um, so as I began to think about some ways I needed to break down these barriers um, to really develop and understand my own abilities around data literacy. Um, I try to think of connecting it back to information literacy, which is something I was really comfortable with. Um, and as I began to explore the intersectional nature of the different types of literacy and how they all fit under this umbrella of critical thinking, um, which I very much view as at the heart of what all librarians do, we help our communities think critically about information, think critically about how they're accessing information, et cetera. Um, that really allowed me to have some room um, to uh, think playfully, creatively, have some curiosity about data and the role of our lives and think more deeply about how our patrons are interacting with data literacy every day and the implications for not being data literate. Uh, so I wanted to start that off by just saying I recognize this is a scare can be a scary topic um, because there's a lot of components in it, but we already have the skills within us to begin engaging very much with data literacy. So we can go ahead to the next slide. So the reason I really love this definition from Pothier and Condon is that real world aspect, right? So as librarians working with the public 
or with students, this emphasis on real world questions really connects deeply with, I think, many of our desires to help patrons have enough information and know how to challenge and ask questions about data presented and consumed by them. Um, I found this survey really interesting. This was a, is a great recent article published in Public Library Quarterly. Um, and it asked patrons uh, from an, a library in Indiana um, what data related workshops would they consider useful? And the number one response was to solve problems in my community. Um, so I think this is particularly relevant for public librarians. If you've not thought of your library as a member, as an important member of your data ecosystem, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, you are because you are providing a community space, whether that's virtual or public, uh, to teach data literacy skills and you can teach them given the context of community issues that are really going to provide a meaningful learning experience. So there's data always around us, but especially in 2020, right, we have a reawakening to social justice, we have COVID-19, we have an election, and there are statistics coming out of the wazoo, right? So there's opportunities here to really begin some community conversations around those statistics and draw into data literacy. Um, the, other ask, the other point I want to make here is, you know, we provide our communities and we advocate for really sophisticated databases and resources, several of which are provided to us through NC Live that provide um, some, some pretty heavy data uh, information within them, right? But if we're not providing the ability to interpret our patrons, the ability to interpret and analyze and conclusively use that data held within them, um, we have to ask ourselves, are our patrons really benefiting from the powerful opportunities provided by these tools? So thinking about ways we can actively begin to integrate um, data literacy into not only our programming, right, but also thinking about the reference interview. Um, how can we begin to, when a patron calls to ask us, um, you know, well, what's the margin of error in this election? Why are they recounting things? What, what does that all mean? Opening up to some larger conversations and additional resources. Um, that's just one way we can begin to integrate this concept of data literacy into our everyday conversations we're having with patrons. And also our collection. Our collections are still used. They're used differently. We have online collections, of course, and our physical print collections. But there are some really wonderful materials out there. Nancy and I um, will link at the end of our presentation today to several online resources. You may be interested in connecting with your patrons or for your own education. But there's lots of great information out there that you can build programs around or recommend to people. Um, and I also want to highlight here, I do not view it as our jobs as librarians to um, help patrons analyze the data. I'm not a data analyst, I'm not a statistician, but I am an information professional. So what I do view my role as is getting them connected to the best sources of data. That's, that's something we're all trained to do, to, to understand um, the different information literacy concepts that go into data literacy. And that's something we're very capable of doing. And that's a really important role, right? Um, so, to help them get connected to that data and then get connected to members in our data ecosystems that can further help them learn how to analyze and gain, gain those, stills, those skills to really dig into that data in hopes um, that one day we're not only creating data consumers, right? But maybe we're even creating data creators and how exciting is that? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so some examples of data literacy you are probably already doing in your libraries um, and some examples from some other libraries. So first off, if you've ever helped a patron figure out what Google Drive is, <laughs> what, what cloud folders are and how to organize them and upload information and organize that information, that's a pretty critical component of data literacy, right? The satisfactory organization and accessibility of information, right? Microsoft Excel, if you've helped a patron uh, organize data or numbers in an Excel sheet and begin to use formulas and maybe create a, a fancy pie chart, or, oh, look at this, you know, let's use a bar chart as opposed to a pie chart. And how does that tell a different story? You know, those are all very, kind of beginning stages of understanding and introducing data literacy. When we think about the resources we're interacting with on a daily basis, um, many of them, for example, provided to us through NC Live, Data Axle Reference Solutions, formerly Reference USA, 
Simply Analytics. These are all great sources of data sets. And um, I particularly love the way they begin to visualize data. That's a great way to introduce data visualization to our patrons and how inputting uh, different information can lead to different results, which tell a different story. And again, that can open up some conversations. Now, I know Simply Analytics, sadly, is going away at the end of the year. One good uh, replacement for that would be the census department's data. And I'm the first one to admit that's kind of a, a scary prospect. The census, <laughs> census data is, is a, a, can be a little bit hard to tackle, but I definitely want to put a plug here. Um, for the help, I'm an accidental government librarian series. They have great webinars on government data, uh, sources of government data, and how to use uh, government data. So I'd highly recommend start plugging into that now so that you can get more comfortable with uh, census data. And then finally, um, as an example of a library that's doing some pretty cool um, work around uh, data literacy, one I'm, I'm kind of jealous of, the Providence Public Library in Rhode Island. They actually have two uh, data workshops they do for teens and for adults. It's a series of data literacy workshops and it's really exciting. And so I've linked out um, I've linked out uh, on this slides, which you'll get about that information. All right, Nancy, next slide. Okay, so to kind of wrap all this up. So if you're a public librarian, if you're a librarian in general, and you're trying to think of, you know, what are some next steps to really start to engage with data literacy more and to work it into my everyday work. So reflection, I think is key, um, especially when it comes to professional development. So where is your library at? And where are you at? If data literacy freaks you out, own that, okay, and use that for some power to motivate you to have it not freak you out. Um, this is where I want to make a plug for the data ecosystems. As business librarians, we love to talk about ecosystems, entrepreneurial ecosystems, financial ecosystems, it's like our buzzword. Um, but data ecosystems are real. So look around in your community. Do you have universities? Do you have businesses that are engaging with data um, that are doing workshops or have done a press release um, talking about a, a new um, survey or, or, or a data set that has been released? Um, look to them for ways to increase what you're doing yourself. So here in Greensboro, I really consider our um, place in the data, data ecosystem as being access to the data, right? We can recommend data sets, we can recommend databases, we can recommend <clears throat> print or online resources to start learning a little bit more about data. And then we can refer out to some of our university partners, some of our, our local businesses um, to really get that analyzation um, component from it or bring them in for programming. Um, so programming and partnership, I think is really critical, especially for public libraries when it comes to further embracing data literacy. And then finally, um, I'm a librarian, I love TED Talks, <laughs> of course, it's like stereotype number 5,000. Um, so Jordan Morrow uh, did this great TED Talk about, he's a data analyst talking about uh, data literacy in our lives. I mean, we have smart refrigerators, people that are collecting data on us, right? And if you don't know what's going on with that data, that can be kind of freaky. So knowledge is a great way to combat fear. Um, so, so thinking about making data a creative process, being curious about it um, can really help you overcome some of those barriers and hopefully help your patrons overcome um, some of those barriers. And last but not least, my all time favorite quote, I have it sitting on my desk right here from Georgia O'Keeffe. I've been absolutely terrified every moment of, of my life and I've never let it keep me from doing a single thing I wanted to do. So I definitely encourage you to take the bull by the horns and dig into some of those data concepts. Over to you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Morgan, for sharing about public libraries and data literacy. And now for the academic librarians in the room, um, we'd love to talk some about data literacy in the academic library context. Um, so data phrases you may hear are big data and open data, data management in the curriculum, data science, visualization, data literacy. Um, what other data phrases have you heard or do you hear in your um, in your context? Um, please feel free to share those in the chat. Um, data curation. 
data analytics, data equity, data cleaning, compliance with federal mandates, the NSF um, grant requirements for data sharing, spatial data, data mining, data privacy. All of these are phrases that do have meaning. Um, and at least for me, some of them are as vague and unhelpful to understand, or they're as vague as data literacy can be. Um, so thanks for sharing your data driven. <laughs> yes, I hear that often as well. Um, so in the midst of all of this noise about words about data, um, it can it can feel hard or be actually or like actually be hard to narrow down to like what is actually happening, what should I consider in my library. Um, so here are some suggestions from my own experience um, of things to consider in your library as you're thinking about how can I get involved with data literacy or what is the role of my library? What is my role in my library? Um, so first, what is the culture in your library and your institution around data literacy? Um, my organization is 100% behind the idea that the library should have a seat at the data literacy, at the proverbial data literacy table. And so this culture informs the work that I can do in my own institution. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm in a position as a business and economics subject specialist at a large institution, and my organization has an entire department of data specialists. So because I have that privilege to refer the comp like really complicated data questions to my colleagues, um, that's not always the case at most libraries and for a lot of librarians. Um, so again, what is the culture at your library? Um, so maybe your institution is kind of at the beginning stages of thinking about data literacy. And so maybe you're, cult, maybe you're in the kind of culture space of needing to make the case of why data literacy has a place in your library or why your library has a place in data literacy. Um, or maybe you are already doing data literacy work and you face the continual challenge of marketing that fact to your faculty and students and campus community. On a smaller note, um, considering as Morgan talked about, what is your knowledge and experience? Um, where are you wanting to grow? Um, as you're taking stock of what's going on at your institution and in your library, uh, think about how can different data literacy initiatives impact your own professional development. Um, in my own experience this past year, um, there was a movement in the undergraduate curriculum to add a data literacy credit hour to um, one of the gen ed, one of the required general education classes for all undergraduates. And so I was invited to participate in a data literacy working group to investigate what role does the library have in developing the curriculum for this one credit hour in the in the general education courses? Um, and that was the first kind of exposure I had to libraries and data literacy. And then somehow that has snowballed to giving a giving a facilitating a workshop for undergraduate business students. Um, writing a book chapter <laughs> about that workshop and having given several presentations in the past several months about data literacy in libraries. Um, I didn't plan it necessarily this way, but I have definitely been able to build my knowledge um, over the course of um, these professional development opportunities. Um, so I encourage you to look for opportunities um, in that way as well. And Really importantly, what is your capacity? Uh, as librarians, we already wear too many hats and I don't want this to be a, you must do all the data literacy things. Um, so what is the, your capacity for incorporating data literacy into the work that you're doing? Um, data literacy is important, uh, but it's more important 
to be realistic and be strategic about what we're taking on. Um, earlier, Morgan touched on the overlap between information literacy and data literacy. And so one thing that I think about is what from my information literacy instruction playbook can be adapted to data literacy. And some examples that came to mind when I was thinking about this was um, curriculum mapping that I sit down with course syllabi or the course catalog to identify uh, where can I approach faculty to integrate kind of general information literacy instruction. And um, can I do, when I'm doing that already, can I also target a couple of courses for data literacy instruction? Um, if I'm already doing faculty interviews and outreach for another project, can I also slip in the question of what kind of data work do you ask your students to do? So this idea of data literacy in a one shot. So thinking, so I'm moving past the things to consider in my library. Um, I'm sure most of us um, encounter one shot instruction sessions as our primary means of interacting with students in a classroom environment. And this is how I have been incorporating data literacy into my instruction in the past year or so. I was, I'm just the visitor for an hour. <laughs> what do I teach? And as always, less is definitely more. Um, if the instructor asks, even if the instructor asks to can you teach finding data? Can you also teach data visualization? Um, yeah, what if I'm asked to teach all the things? Um, again, what is my capacity? And uh, so with keeping in mind my own capacity and skill set, and here are some additional thoughts that I have about data literacy in a one shot. Um, primarily, we as librarian teachers are creating space for students to learn and reflect on the use of data and for me as the instructor to learn and reflect. Um, students know a lot of things and I, if I leave a session without learning something from the students, then I consider that a failed session. Um, so Using backwards design, choosing one, maybe two learning objectives. Um, also, what content can I adapt or repurpose if I have a, a kind of a discussion group activity that I use for information literacy instruction? Can I just change the content of the discussion or um, how can I adapt things I already have? Or repurpose. Uh, materials that other librarians and other folks have shared um, online or in in other contexts. Um, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And again, using um, your instruction experience uh, for information literacy, research strategies, um, you know how to teach stuff. And also, like I said before, students know stuff. Um, this junk charts trifecta checkup is created by Kaiser Fung, who writes the blog uh, Junk Charts. And um, this blog, he, he takes a look at data visualizations and analyzes the use of the data visualization in different media sources. Um, it's a great blog. I have used his content for data literacy workshops in the past. And so I didn't have to understand the analysis. I just had to be able to talk about it. <laughs> learning from Kaiser Fung's really excellent blog posts. And again, the overlap between information literacy and data literacy is real. And really, it's this question of critical thinking. Um, I'm a big proponent of asking students why, asking them to evaluate their own assumptions and to think about and question the assumptions put forth by the data collectors and organizers and how it's written in the journal article or the media article or whatever kind of um, 
whatever the thing is you're having them look at or whatever the thing is that they are being asked to do. So with that note, it's also about finding partners. Um, I won't reiterate all of what Morgan mentioned, but partnerships are key. So who is doing, who else is doing data literacy stuff at your institution? And to find your place as a partner, uh, think about what strengths that you as a librarian have, uh, such as the expert searching know-how to find ever elusive data sets. Um, we, we're curious, we like to learn, we have the skills, you may have the skills to pick up enough of a new tool to teach the basics, or at least identify tutorials and things to point um, learners to when they're learning a new tool. Um, but I'll reiterate to be strategic. Um, keep your personal and professional values in mind and remember your capacity. Um, try to avoid taking on too much. And to round out our presentation, we want to talk about um, data as an advocacy tool. So turn it back over to you, Morgan. Thank you. Go ahead and send the next slide. So we oftentimes hear, uh, it's already been mentioned in the chat, uh, the data informed library, uh, data driven, et cetera. Et cetera. So what, what does that actually mean? Um, so I want to approach this from an advocacy standpoint. Um, you know, 2020 has been rough on lots of institutions, lots of people. Um, but uh, for libraries, you know, we might be thinking about um, funding issues, staffing issues, et cetera. So um, how can you be a data informed library might be one way or thinking about data and how you can use it to advocate for your library might be one kind of approachable way to begin digging into um, actually collecting data, analyzing data and putting it into use. So this is probably one way you're actually already participating in data collection, right? So the infamous door counts, circulation statistics, programming statistics, right? You're probably collecting all that information and that is certainly useful data um, that can be put to work in your advocacy measures. But one other way to think about um, data literacy um, and the types of information we're collecting, I like to connect it to stories. I'm an English major. Uh, so when I think about uh, numbers, again, that freaks me out. So when I can connect data to stories and the stories that data tells, that's where it starts to get really exciting for me. And I like to think about this idea of impact data versus performance data. Um, and this is especially relevant for advocacy. Um, so if we think about performance data, right, that's gonna be door counts, that's gonna be circulation statistics, et cetera. But impact data is definitely valuable and it does tend to have, as opposed to a quantitative element, it also has a qualitative element to it, right? So impact data is things like knowledge and skills, behaviors, attitude, quality of life. Um, so the example I have on the screen there, right? So yes, you count how many uh, patrons come to a computer class, a computer literacy class, but impact data would take it a step further and you would survey those patrons, interview those patrons and ask them, um, did you use the skills or were there specific skills you used um, in this computer literacy class to get a job? Um, and that, even if, it, even if the, the number is something as simple as, you know, 50% of the people who attended our class used, it, used these skills to get a new job. When um, a board member reads that, when a city council person reads that, that definitely starts to form a picture in their mind, right? There's a story there of somebody obtaining a job and that makes a real life um, impact on somebody's life. Uh, if you wanna learn more about um, data advocacy, I definitely would recommend checking out, we link to it here on the slides, um, the Turning the Page um, curriculum, which was done um, by the Public Library Association with funding um, by the Mel Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, it was originally done in 2007. It was updated in 2014, and I still find it to be pretty relevant if you're thinking about some different ways um, or want a tool, uh, a toolkit um, to really begin um, inputting data into your advocacy work. All right, over to you, Nancy. So we want to kind of end this piece of our presentation um, 
with what are your stories about data literacy, data advocacy, um, anything in your experience related to data, um, and what advice do you have? Um, so I'd invite you to either share in the um, chat or uh, use the raise hand in the participants. Um, and we can invite you to unmute and speak verbally if you'd like. From Lenny in the chat, every project makes you starter, smarter about data, for sure. Um, then Audrey writes, um, they just finished Library Journal's equity and action training for auditing your collection. Um, Audrey, can you speak a little more about what the equity and action training is? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, our diversity support team um, su financially supported my co-librarian and I um, to complete Library Journal's Equity in Action um, professional development. Um, and it was a, I want to say it was three to four weeks, about five hours a week. Um, it was way more intense than we anticipated <laughs> in a good way. Um, but each week we had like four different speakers that we would listen to. And then we had um, kind of like checkpoints. And so by the end of it, um, we were given like audit examples um, of different ways to start to audit your collection for all things equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, so right now, we have only made it through the A's um, of fiction, author, author last name A, <laughs> um, but we, we have a spreadsheet um, that my co-librarian created, which is just wonderful, um, and it has us looking at I mean, absolutely everything, um, religion, race, um, gender, sexuality, um, ability, like just everything. Um, and then what we do is we're putting a little tick mark in the column. So it's gonna function not only as an audit, but it's also gonna hopefully be a living document long past the time that we're here, so almost as a reader's advisory tool. Um, and so the last thing that I put in the chat, like as far as numbers go with, with this specifically, um, some of the speakers were very dialed into the numbers um, to say, you know, if you have 25% of this population out in the community, then your collection should be representing 25% at least. Um, and so I think from an awareness side of things, that's a great tool. Um, but then another speaker that we listened to was very much a proponent of all stories matter for everybody. Um, and so definitely being aware of some of that diversity, inclusion, and equity in your collection, um, but not trying to just meet, meet the mark and put a check in the box. So, yeah. Thank you so much. That's a really neat, really important project. And um, that kind of collection audit is, a, is something I've been meaning to get on now that our semester's over. Thanks for sharing. Oh. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Audrey. And one thing I wanted to, um, one thing that really struck me was um, you were thinking about the longevity of the document itself. So how the data is going to live on and perhaps be useful um, in different capacities. Um, and I think that's, you know, if, if when you put some thought um, into what's the end use of this data, what are some other uses of this data, and how can we make it accessible in the long term with the, the lifespan of this data, right? I think that's, I think that's really awesome. Yeah, so if other folks have um, stories, aha, Sean writes, They've been working with education graduate students um, trying to introduce data literacy around the data they, the students, are generating through literature searches and reviews. Um, it's very basic, but the students seem to like it. Sean, I would like to talk with you about that more later. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's great, John. And, and from a public library perspective, you know, I talk a lot with my entrepreneurs about secondary and primary research, right? So we do a lot of secondary research here at the library, but we do touch on a concept of primary research, right? Collecting their own sales statistics, what products are moving, when are they moving? Um, and um, that seems like such a simple kind of concept, um, but it's such a powerful source of information. And, um, you know, when I, I provide suggestions about different ways that can be organized and utilized, um, and that, and they just feel so empowered by that. And I think that's, that really is what really excites me about data literacy is how empowered um, it can help our customers feel. Randy writes, um, with trying to be more aware of collecting data for assessment of library instruction, we started using Project Outcome from ACRL. I actually attended, Project Outcome did a presentation at, did a workshop for my institution a year and a half ago, I think, um, but I'm not sure. That, so I've, so I'm familiar with, with Project Outcome, but we, I don't know that I have been using that. Um, that's really, that's really neat. Yeah, assessing instruction is always, is always hard. Yeah, when I think about my own use of data and collecting data on um, instruction, I have kind of wavered between just looking at the numbers of classes that I teach um, and actually, Audrey, my institute, my institution use, uses Lib Insights um, for tracking instruction and consultation statistics. Um, but I, so, so sometimes I just look at the the sheer the basic numbers, but then I I like to do a qualitative assessment as well of um, the minute paper. Um, what's one important thing you learned, and what's in, one important question you still have, and if I, the semesters that I have my act together, I'll download all that data at the end of the semester and kind of look look through for trends and and if there's a lot of questions from the same class, if one class has a lot of the same questions, then I'm like, all right, next time I teach that class, I should focus um, focus the content a little differently. Um, Allison writes, um, I think it's important to be humble as both Nancy and Morgan have alluded to in their presentation that we as librarians aren't going to be able to be all to all folks looking for assistance with data. And we can't do the analysis, but we can help with questions about how to interpret and be curious about data. It's really important, yeah. Pat writes, or excuse me, Pam writes, I don't get too involved with systematic reviews in my job, but some health science librarians do. And part of what some of them do is help manage the various parts of documenting search strategies and managing the references. I have a lot of my coworkers in the health sciences library at UNC Chapel Hill do that. Lauren writes, I'm working with my department academic to revamp workshops and provides the data info lit resource. Yes, please keep sharing your stories and advice. Um, I'm also gonna, if you just have general questions, um, I'll just kind of open the floor for that as well. Um, and our contact information is here on the slide. Um, and I will highlight too, um, following this slide, we have um, kind of put our top hits <laughs> in terms of what resources we really love. Uh, to stay informed about data literacy, what it is, how it works, um, how to integrate it into your libraries and your professional development. Yes, yeah, so here's here's the one slide. And then we also, for librarians in North Carolina, um, here's a few ebooks um, from available through the NC Live um, collections. Um, Sarah writes, I'm a big fan of data literacy trainings from the Carpentries. They do have a library carpentry track, yes. Um, has anyone done that training? And, or has anyone who has done, completed that training have any additional thoughts about it? Um, I had some coworkers who 
participated a couple of years ago, um, but I was not able to, to participate in that. One other um, program that we've done here at the Greensboro Public Library um, for kids uh, that was actually um, it was small, but it was pretty well received. We um, we we uh, do learning circles um, through the peer to peer university and um, one of our branch librarians completed a coding workshop for kids. Um, over the summer, um, and that was a really fun way to get uh, young people. Uh, interested in data and coding um, and they were just so proud of what they produced um, and that definitely lent some enthusiasm uh, for carry on that curiosity throughout their lives um, and it was a fun way um, to to be, get to them young <laughs> as it were Yes, and that was BB <laughs> in the comments. She's one of our branch li librarians who, BB, would you mind sharing just a little bit? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what that experience was like um, uh, completing that. Yeah, no problem. Um, it was, yeah, I think it was in July. Um, and uh, there were four students that whose parents signed them up and um, three of them ended up participating and it was, let's see, it was, so normally learning circles are like across four or five weeks and it's one session a week, but for that one we ran it um, kind of like a summer camp, like a virtual summer camp. So we did um, four days, I think it was Monday through Thursday. And then I actually ended up having to add an extra day because one of the days, um, two of the participants couldn't come. So they actually came on the on the Friday, but um, it was originally set up for like four one and a half hour sessions, like back to back. And um, we just went through the scratch coding um, course uh, on online and we were able to go through some um, of the two to three minute videos that they had on that site and then we created our own animations um, in class during during like class time and then we would um, share them with one another so the parents were still in the room of course and they were able to help the kids um, share their screen so that they could share what um, they were working on in class and then we also had like little homework assignments and I'm putting it in quotes homework assignments um, to kind of make their uh, animation more robust while they were you know at home not not in the in the coding session and then we would come back the next day and show how our animation progressed and um, one one of the participants made just a little story that you don't really interact with. And then two of the participants actually made um, more of like a game. <laughs> so there was, um, they added like a scoreboard and a timer and different things like that. And that was really cool for them to just see a video and take it to the next level. They really tr truly did whatever they, they wanted with it. And to have a smaller group was really neat because they were able to share with one another and they even helped each other out, which was pretty neat, um, making suggestions on how they could improve or like, I can't get him to spin this way. You know, how can I, how can I put the code in in the right order in order to make, that, make it do what I want it to do? So they were able to help each other out with that. Um, and yeah, one of the parents was very excited about um, her son's progress. And at the end, we sent a, a certificate to them and she printed it out and had like a little graduation ceremony over Zoom with her, um, with uh, her son's um, aunt and grandmother. And so like, that was really neat. And so she sent me a picture of that. And that was just, just more into your point, like just having that story um, was just, was huge. Thank you so much for sharing, BB. I think that's great that you had a graduation ceremony for them. Awesome. <laughs> All 
other questions or stories that you'd like to share? Nancy and Morgan, thank you so much for facilitating this discussion. What I'm going to do is um, once I get the transcript of the chat, I'm just going to copy some of the resources that were shared in the chat and send that out as well with the follow up email so that we can gather some of these great resources that folks have shared throughout the session. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Oh, yes. Thank you, Larry. Um, the Biz Liberatory blog. Um, that I co-write with Angel Truesdale and Summer Krastavska. We've had some really great um, posts from my co-writers, but also some great guest posts about data literacy and data resources, um, specifically um, specifically in the business disciplines. Um, Reese Steinberg wrote a great post about storytelling with data um, last winter, I want to say. Um, but if you are a business librarian or work with business as one of your liaison subjects, or if you're a public librarian and work with businesses in your community and you want to write a guest post, um, please reach out. Please feel free to reach out um, about that. We are always looking for folks to share your experiences and reflections on business librarianship. Thanks for sharing that, Larry. Thanks, uh, Devin. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Nancy and Morgan, for taking the time today to do this. Um, I feel like you provided such a nice holistic approach to the whole experience of data literacy. And um, I really like hearing both that public and academic library perspective because I think that that collaboration is so fruitful. Um, there's more overlap than I think we realize at times. And so um, if you really enjoyed this session or have some feedback to share, um, I'm going to drop a link to the survey now so that you are welcome to fill out your response before you see that follow up email in your inbox today. Um, and thank you guys so much. Honestly, it's always such a pleasure to work with you both. Thank you. Y'all have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Hi, Atticus. He's a little grumpy today, but he, uh, he enjoyed the presentation, it made him quiet. Happy to anytime. <laughs> Say hi, Nancy. Hi, Atticus. She knows your name. <laughs> <laughs>